If you have your Bible, please turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. It's good to be back. Had the last couple of Sundays off, and I'll tell you that it was nice to get some, some rest. I feel refreshed this morning. And it's always good to be back home. It's always good to be back with, um, with my church, uh, with my people, uh, with, the, with this flock that um, God has made us a part of. It's always good. I had the opportunity to visit, and um, visiting is always good. I, I was reminded in coming in to visit a church uh, even though I'm a pastor and um, been a Christian for a number of years, there's still something about walking into a church for the first time uh, that um, it is uneasy. You don't know what to expect. You don't know how the people are going to receive you. And, and so having gone through that experience, it, it made me think about those who come to our church uh, for the first time. And if you're our first time guest this morning, I hope that our uh, folks have made you welcome, and, and they have been warm and kind to you. I, I, I commend you for coming. I know it is um, sometimes blind when you walk in, you don't know what to expect. I will tell you that uh, the church I visited, I, I did not wear a tie. I did wear a coat and slacks, and uh, about three people asked me if I was a pastor. I thought, well, maybe I have this written on me or something. I don't know including uh, the former pastor of that church, as well as the, the interim pastor that was preaching that Sunday. One of the things that I noted when I was there was, um, was the, the worship service, and I, and I use that word rather loosely. I, I know we don't have any frills when we come to worship the Lord. We don't do uh, the lights going down like they did at that particular church. I was not expecting that. I know that the Scripture says the men... Uh, that men love the darkness, but um, as believers in Christ, we love the light. And, uh, and it was more of a concert, um, and, I, and I just want to say how much I appreciate Barry and the way that uh, he leads us in uh, worship through song. I appreciate uh, Brian Mullet, who in my absence come in and, and fills the pulpit we are truly blessed. We are truly blessed. And, and I like the fact that there's, um, again, not so much focus and attention on us, but rather when we come, we've come to worship the Lord. We want to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And, and I like that. And I know that a lot of folks are looking for something else, but I'm just looking to worship and serve the Lord. And I don't... I don't take for granted what we have here. So I, I just thank God for you and thank God uh, that he has brought us together. Well, I want to look at this chapter. I'm not going to read it because we've already read it in our call to worship this morning. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just uh, let's pray together and then we'll uh, begin to walk through this passage. Father in heaven, uh, we uh, give thanks for our church family. Uh, we thank you for this time that we have set aside and we have gathered to worship you. And Lord, we pray this morning that you uh, would be pleased with the words of your servant. And we pray, Lord, that you would be pleased with the meditation of all of our hearts. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, in coming into this passage this morning, a uh, couple of weeks out, and so you'll recall that uh, last time we were together that we were in chapter 7, and so here we pick up in chapter 8. And what we find interesting in this is that as the story begins, it, it says that it, and it came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his son's judges over Israel. And so what we're told right off the, the bat here is that um, some period has gone by. Samuel is old. And what that's telling us is that the, the, the time frame from chapter 7, where the events happened in chapter 7, to now what is recorded in chapter 8, 
uh, there's a, a lot of time that has gone by. In fact, as we'll see, and we've already read this, that Samuel's sons have grown older. Uh, he has older sons, and so probably we're thinking somewhere around 30 years have gone by or transpired between chapter 7 and chapter 8. And why is it that there's not a lot of history in between 7 and 8? And, and I think it's there for a couple of reasons, and we'll draw out some of that as we look at this, but I, I think primarily as we can see a contrast between chapter 7 and chapter 8, and we'll highlight some of that as we walk through it. But here's what I want to do this morning. I want to keep it real simple. I've been gone two weeks, and so I, I need simplicity this morning, just keeping it real, real simple. And what I want to do, as I was reading through this, I, I noticed that we see in this account that it, it records uh, Israel and, and their reaction uh, to, to three things, really. And, and I'll just highlight it this way, that we see three, reje three rejections uh, that Israel does in this passage. not hard to figure out. The first one is that Israel rejects uh, the appointment of Samuel's sons. And then we'll notice that Israel rejects Yahweh as king, and we'll highlight that. And then finally, Israel rejects the warnings that come from the Word of God. Very simple. So what I want to do is I just want to walk us through this passage, and then I want to, at the end, just make uh, four observations maybe 12, just a few, just a few observations based on this passage of Scripture. So the first thing I want you to notice is the rejection that we see that Israel rejects uh, Samuel's sons. Again, notice that it came about when Samuel was old, in verse number 1, that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. And so you recall that this position of judge, that's what Samuel was. He was a judge. He was uh, ruling. He was judging uh, Israel, not in the sense of a king, but as a judge. It's the position that was set up, and we saw that or highlighted that in the book of Judges, made a reference to that, if you will. So Samuel's a judge, and what's interesting is, is that he appoints his sons as judges. And I say that's interesting because that was not so. It wasn't supposed to be that way. It wasn't like it was the case with Eli and his sons. When you think about Eli and his sons, Eli was a high priest, and so the priesthood was hereditary. And so we would, we would expect that the high priest's sons would be in the priesthood. It is hereditary. It goes through the line of those people, like the Levites or the Aaronites. We, we see that those people, it was a hereditary position, but as a judge, it was not hereditary. And yet, Samuel appoints his sons as judges. Just a, a quick note that he tells us in this passage of Scripture, we're told their names. And I think that's significant. Because these sons, their name's Joel, which means Yahweh is God. And the second son is Abijah, which means my father is Yahweh, or Yahweh is father. That is their names, and yet they're set up to be judges. But we see, based on their behavior, in verse number 3, that their behavior did not match their name. It says in verse 3 that his sons, however did not walk justice. There's the progression that sighed after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. There's the progression that takes place. In other words, the inclination of the heart is, is towards dishonest gain, and if dishonest gain is the inclination of the heart, then you're going to take bribes, and if that's the case, then you're going to pervert justice. And this is there's a description of the sons of Samuel. Reminds you of anything, it certainly reminds you a little bit of Eli. Uh, although Eli and his sons uh, were more closer together, in other words, Eli had direct oversight over his sons. Samuel's sons uh, are, are probably some distance away from Samuel, but nonetheless, they're walking after, uh, they're not walking the same way that their father is. They're, they're after dishonest gain. And as you look at this, the, the sons of Israel, Israel decides when they hear this, this coming up, they, 
they reject that these sons, because they're not the same as their father, they're not walking the same way that he is, they said, no, we're not going to let this happen. We're not going to let these sons be judges because of their walk, because of their behavior. As I was reading that, I thought about that, that these are men who who have these good names given to them. Joel is Yahweh is God, and Abijah is my father is Yahweh. And yet, their behavior does not match up with their name. I couldn't help but think about us that we have been, as believers in Christ, given the name of Christians. We are little Christ. Uh, we are followers of Christ. And the question for you this morning is, is uh, are you living up to that name? Or, or do, does your behavior reflect the name that you're called? Well, theirs did not. And so they rejected these sons. And that's where we begin to see in verse number 4, these elders of Israel, and they had gathered together, and they came to, to Samuel, and they said to him, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. And so here we see that they have rejected these sons, but don't miss this. They use the, this opportunity as a pretext to ask for a king. I, I got to think about this, and, as, and I've had a, a lot of time to ponder and, and, and just meditate on this particular passage this week. This was not something that uh, just all of a sudden came up, that the elders all of a sudden just one day said, hey, let's appoint us a king. You, you understand that it was there already. It was something that they had been thinking about. And the right opportunity comes. There's a pretext now. Hey, this is the time where we can ask for a king. And as we saw in this, they're asking for a king. And the reason that they want a king is a couple reasons. One is because they want to be like all the other nations. And also, because Uh, Not only do they want to be like all the other nations, but they also want a king to go out and fight their battles for them. And this is the rejection of Yahweh as their king. Because if we don't see anything else in chapter 7, we should have seen this at Ebenezer, that Yahweh is their king of Israel and that Yahweh will fight and has fought for his people. Amen? In chapter 7, he fights for them. So, so they're asking for a king to fight for them. They've already got a king to fight for them. But they're looking, besides looking to the Lord, now they're looking to something more um, physical, something that they can see more tangible than by faith trusting in Yahweh. And this is where Samuel gets really upset because they have rejected him, he thinks, first. And they have, in some ways, they have rejected him as judge. But ultimately, as we see, they have rejected the Lord. Look at verse number 6. They asked for a king to uh, judge us like all the nations. And we might think of judge in terms of, of, of rule, But verse 6 says, but the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel. And when they said, God, and when they said, give us a a king to judge us. And and literally, we might say a better translation would be that this was evil in the sight of Samuel. Samuel saw that this was evil. Notice what Samuel does in verse number 6. He prays to the Lord. He goes to the Lord on behalf of the people. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they said to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Like all the deeds which they have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt, even to this day, and that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. 
So the Lord says to Samuel, yeah, they're rejecting you as judge, but ultimately they are rejecting me as king. But I want you to listen to them. And we'll highlight that in a moment. I want you to listen to the people. And, and, and this is the thing, is that they're, we've seen this before, and he points this out, that, they, that the people are, have a propensity, a tendency to go after false gods, to go after idols. Don't we all? We all have that tendency. You know, I, I mentioned getting a lot of rest on my vacation, but there was a lot of testing, too, on my vacation. I just, I, I got a, a, a lot, of, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to tell you what happened. A couple of things happened. Got tested. I, I went to uh, uh, this warehouse uh, store. You figured out. I, I went, they, they sell all of these um, groceries and different kinds of items, household items, and I went and I bought a new easy chair. A reading chair is what I called it. Everybody, everybody should have a reading chair. And, 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 I, and I went in and I went through the cash register and, when I, went and, I, and I was paying attention. I thought, well, this was a lot cheaper than I thought. And I, and I walked out the door and when I went out the door, I, I, I didn't realize it until I got out the door, but the the, the flag, the, 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 little, the little tag that was on top began to, to, the wind picked it up a little bit and it flipped over. And what I realized is that they had, it was the wrong tag. It was the tag that they had scanned, but it was the wrong tag for the chair that I bought. It was almost $100 cheaper. What you going to do, preacher? Yeah, so, 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 uh, I, I, I walked right back in the store, and I, and I had to convince those people to let me pay more money. They, they, didn't, they didn't know what, what, what's going on. It, it was three or four things like that happened. My neighbor, I, I mentioned this on a Wednesday night, that I've been uh, helping my neighbor mow. I've been mowing his grass for him. He's got a young family, and, and, uh, and so I've been mowing his grass. He didn't have time to get out there, so I, 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 that's what I've been doing. Well... I went to mow his grass, and I ran over his water hose. So now it's going to cost me $30 to mow his grass because i got to replace the water hose. And, and here's the thing about it is that we're always being tested. Always. And, and, and the thing, and, and I found myself, even with my neighbor, I found myself, he, you know, he's going to want me to replace this water hose. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do what's right, and I'm going to do that, but I, I'm just going to quit being nice to people. I'm going to quit doing things like this. Y'all, y'all look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about, but you, you it's, it's, a, it's a, a struggle. It, it's something that we, we all wrestle with. At the store, the, 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 the tendency is, is that, and I've heard folks do this, well, God just blessed me with, with this $100 discount. No, it is stealing. And, and even though it wasn't intentional on your part, once it's made clear, once you know that, then you're to do what's right. Whatever my intention was in helping my neighbor, I, I want to make sure that I'm loving my neighbor. And we, we all fight and we struggle, and being a, a preacher does not make us exempt from this. We all struggle with these tendencies. But the question is, is that do we believe that Yahweh is king, and do we believe that the Lord Jesus is ruling and reigning, and do we believe that He sees and knows all? And so it's not a matter of of the cashier, whether or not she caught this tag. It's a matter of Yahweh. It's a matter of the Lord. Did He see it? And if it's became known to me, then I need to do something about it. Well, these Israelites, essentially what they were doing is they were saying, we do not want to be Israel anymore. There's a reversal of the Sinai covenant that, that really is taking place. 
Because when God called, Egypt, or called Israel out of Egypt and they became a, a nation, he told them, you look at it up in, in Exodus chapter 19, that he calls them to be a holy people, a, a holy priesthood, a peculiar people. He calls them to be holy and, and separate, to be different from the nations. And the very thing that they say is that we don't want to be different. I'm tired of being different. I just want, they get away with it. I just want to be like everybody else. And it's a rejection of who Israel is as a people. It's a rejection of who we are as the church. Uh, we're, we have the same, uh, in, in 1 Peter, we're, we're told the same thing, that, that what is said about Israel is said about us, that we are a peculiar people, that we're a nation that is to be holy. We're a, a, a priesthood, a royal priesthood. And we're called to be separate. We're called to be different. And they were rejecting this. They were saying, we, we don't want to be different. We just want to be like everybody else. Give us a king like everybody else. And we don't want Yahweh to fight our battles for us. We want a king. And let me just give you a modern translation. We want the government to look after us. We don't want Yahweh. We don't want to trust the Lord. Now, now here's the irony. And I'm not going to go through every one of these verses, but just highlight something that you see here. In verse number 10, where Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord to the people, he, he tells them the procedure for the king, the, the one that's going to reign over them. And notice what he says. Now, this is, there's a sense of irony that's here because, because here these, these, uh, the, the sons of Samuel were taking bribes. They were taking. And here's the irony is that when you want a king to rule over you, he's going to take from you. You think it was costly what these sons of Samuel were taking? Look at verse number 11. He will, this king is going to take your sons and place them for himself in his chariots among his horsemen. And by the way, chariots and horses, do you not see the parallel? They're going back to Egypt. Verse 13, he'll also take your daughters. Verse 14, he'll take the best of your fields and your vineyards. He's going to take the best fruit from you. Verse 15, he'll take a tenth of your seed, of, of your vineyards. Verse 16, he'll take your male servants and your female servants and your best young men and your donkeys, and he'll use them for his work. He'll, he'll take a tithe, in, in verse number 17, of your, your flocks and you yourselves will become his servants. You want a king? Here, here's the warning. Yeah, you can have a king, but understand this, that he's going to take and take and take and take. We won't have time to look at it, but I, I think it's in Deuteronomy 17. You, you see that there was a provision that was made for Israel having a king. It was part of God's plan that Israel was going to have a king. And the problem was not that Israel wanted to have a king. The problem was the motive and the reason that they wanted to have a king. Do you understand that? You can ask for the right thing but have the wrong motives, which is what they did. They wanted to be like the other nations, and they wanted someone that would fight their battles which is the opposite of the Sinai Covenant. Firstly, they, they reject. So then thirdly, this, they rejected. Firstly, they, they rejected the, the sons of, of Samuel. Then they rejected Yahweh as their king. But then thirdly, they rejected the warnings of the Word of God. He tells them that this is what this king is going to do. And in verse 13, he says, and then you're going to cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. I'm going to give you what you want, 
but understand you're going to be miserable, and then you're going to cry out, and then the Lord's not going to answer you. And look at verse 13, or verse 18, I should, 19. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. So the warning of the word is there. God has given them a warning. Nevertheless, they said, no, we want a king. And after Samuel had heard all the, the words of the people, look at verse 21. He repeated them in the Lord's hearing. Samuel's not praying. Samuel's just saying, this is what the people said. And here's what the Lord says. Listen to their voice and appoint them a king. So Samuel said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. It sets up the next chapter, and we'll see this next week, that there is going to be a procedure for a king. But, but real quickly, and here's what I want to do. I just want to make four observations about this text, and then we'll close out this morning. But as I was reading this, there, there's four things that just become abundantly clear. And you see this with Israel, is that number one is that we have a tendency to assess our problems practically rather than spiritually. We have a tendency to assess our problems practically or mechanically rather than spiritually. When, when Israel saw that, that the, the sons of, of Samuel were wicked, rather than praying and rather than seeking the Lord and trying to figure out what God would have them to do, they thought of a practical solution. And that's us. That when, when some kind of scenario happened, when something uh, troublesome happens for a difficulty, we, we have a tendency to look for a new technique, a new way to do this or stop doing this in order to fix the problem rather than seeking the Lord. Now, I, I want to say this, and I've said this a couple times before, there needs to be balance in our walk with the Lord, our, especially our prayer life. Warren Wearsby said, blessed are the balanced. I think that's, that's true. Not long ago, I was talking about uh, prayer, and I, and I said this. I said that when we pray, that a lot of times the way we pray is we, instead of seeking the Lord, we just ask God to bless what we want to do. Now, now here, here, here's the balance. Because, because we understand that as, as Christians, as believers in Christ, that God wants to mature us, that God wants to grow us. Uh, there, there are some that go to the extreme and they say that we need to pray for everything. We, we need to pray even when we go to our closet and we need to pray about what color tie we're going to wear. Some of you say, preacher, did you really pray about that this morning? No, I didn't pray about that. God, that there's wisdom, there's godly wisdom. God, God wants us to mature. He wants to grow us, and He wants us to be able to make decisions based upon the Word of God. And so the extreme would be to say that we've got to pray about everything. But the other side of that is, is that, is that we are to pray about everything in the sense that 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says that we're to pray without ceasing. That is the idea that we are constantly aware and in communion with the Lord. And, and so I'm, I'm aware of the Lord. I'm, a, I'm aware of His Word. And so, so the balance is when, when David, and we'll see this in chapter 17, when David comes on the scene and, and Goliath is there taunting the people of God, David doesn't take a moment to pray and says, should I go against this giant? No, David's walking with the Lord. Who is this ungodly Philistine that's coming against God's people? Who's blaspheming God? And he just steps out because he's walking with the Lord. So, so there, there is a balance that we understand that God matures us. And that, that there are decisions that we've learned in wisdom and we've learned by the grace of God through the Word of God that we can make. 
But there's also a time that we seek the Lord, which brings us to the second point. While we try to do things practically rather than spiritually, uh, something else that might be said is that instead of looking to God for help, we are often more interested in prescribing what God should do. Here, God, this is what I think you should do in this situation. We wouldn't say it like that, but that's exactly what they were doing. They they were saying, God, we we want a king. Rather than seeking the Lord and asking him, they said, "This this is what we need, and so we want a king. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who many of you know, who's gone on to be with the Lord in the last century, but was a great man of God and preacher. Before he was in the ministry, he was a a medical doctor. And he said about his sermons, he said, I never let the patients write the prescription. That's what he said about his preaching. In other words, I, I I don't get the prescription from the pews. I, I seek the Lord, and I go to the Word of God, and I preach the Word of God. But neither should we prescribe to God what we think is best for this situation. If we're really humble, we won't be looking for a new technique, and we won't be uh, determined to say this is the best way to do it. But if we're really humble, we will say, Lord, I don't need a new technique. I need a new heart. And and humbly I come before you and ask for your guidance and your wisdom. Help me, Lord. And if we're truly trusting in the Lord, then we will trust His methods and His timing as well. It's been my experience that when I ask and I pray about something, it's been my experience that God doesn't answer in my timing. All right? And what I found is that that is a much, that, that, that is a, as big a part as the trust part of it as anything else. In, in other words, waiting on the Lord, being patient and waiting on the Lord, that that's, that's a part of the process. And then trusting the method that He has ordained. Which, which is to say that I don't get to write the prescription. I don't get to say, God, this is what we should do, and I'm asking you to bless it. No, I'm to seek the Lord. And it may be that in his wisdom, he does something entirely different that I've never even thought about. The third thing that I would mention that I see in this passage is that sometimes our Lord answers our request not out of His blessing, but out of our stubbornness. When I read this story, I cannot help but to think about my own children, and those who are parents certainly understand this same scenario, that a child comes and they say, I want to do this, and I want to do this, and you say, no, no. But there are times where your children come to you and you know that it's going to harm them and you know that they should not do it, but so that they will learn. And so that some of that stubbornness will be removed and brought to humility. You say, go ahead and let them do it. And it hurts to watch your children because you know it's going to hurt them. You know they're going to fail. But you do this because you love them. You do this because you, you want to break them of that pride and of that stubbornness. Now, I'm not saying that's the only reason that God ordained the office of king here. Obviously, going back to the book of the law, it was his plan that there would be a king. Ultimately, there is the king of kings and lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And so everything's headed towards him anyway. But at this point in time, he warned them that it was going to be difficult. And yet they decided to do this. 
And so the flip side of that is simply this, is that sometimes the greatest kindness that God can give towards us is to not answer our request. Sometimes the greatest thing God can do in being kind to you is to say no because he knows the outcome and the result. When he said, and so we're just called to trust him. That even when he says no, that we know that he is good and he is gracious and he is loving. I think about a lot of situations and I, I, we won't have time to elaborate on that. Let me just bring out the fourth point. And I'm going to close with this. And it's really practical, which kind of fits the point. Is this, is, is that just because our request is logical, rational, and reasonable, it does not mean that it's godly. It doesn't even mean that it's biblical. They wanted a king to be like the other nations. But the reason was because they wanted someone to fight their battles for them. And the reason was is that they wanted to be like the other nations. And God answered their prayer, but it became an instrument of divine judgment. There's a lot of places we could go with that. And I had a lot of other scripture that I wanted to bring in this morning. But I, I, I'll just simply say this. When I look around our nation and I think about, and we talk about it often, that there's abortion and there's the legalization of homosexual marriages. I mean, all these things that are contrary to the Word of God. And I, and I often hear people will say that because of these things, God is going to bring great judgment on our nation. And let me say this. Because of these things, we know that God is judging our nation. These sinful acts are the judgment of God. God has turned over this nation. But let me remind you that we're not to be like the other nations. And we don't serve Caesar. And our citizenship, while it may be here in the United States, ultimately it is in heaven. And our king, even as Brian Mullet prayed in the beginning, is sovereign over the universe. And so we serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. And He fights for us. And this is a fight that's going on in our culture, in our, in our day and time. And I don't talk enough about it, but I, I want to tell you, we are in a fight. But let me remind you that though we fight, we have one that fights for us. So get up. Get up and start trusting and, and, and start looking to the Lord because if God be for us, then who can be against us? Who is your king? Who is your Lord? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Will you stand with me for prayer? I want to close with where I began, which is where Israel rejected the sons of Samuel. And though they had these good names, Yahweh is God. Yahweh is my Father. And though they bore these names, their conduct suggested that they were contrary to what they called themselves and what they were called. So let me ask you, Christian, does your behavior 
match up with your name? Are you called Christian not only in name, but in deed? And if your conduct is contrary to your name, then let me call you to repent, to turn away from your sin, and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord today. As I pray, I'll ask our deacons and wives to come forward that there's something we can pray with you about. Or if God's leading you to join and be a part of this work, you come. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this reminder, this teaching from Scripture that reminds us that you fight on behalf of your people. And yet in your goodness and your grace, there are sometimes, Lord, that you allow us to fall and to stumble so that we will trust in you. So, Lord, forgive us when we place our trust and our faith in kings and in horses and in chariots. But, Lord, help us to enable us to trust only in you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.